naturally with so much material about different kinship systems emerging, particularly in the 18th and 19th centuries, theoreticians began to speculate as to how they could be explained. Basically, there have been over the last 150 years four major schools of interpretation of kinship systems. And it's at these that I would like to look. The first of these is the evolutionary theorists. In the period of roughly between 1860 and 1910, partly based on Darwinian biology, partly from geology, anthropological theorizing was dominated by the idea of things moving along an evolutionary path through stages, or using a geological metaphor, like rocks, there being various layers. This set of theories had an immense influence on both anthropology and also sociology and other human disciplines, and it's worth briefly considering its central features. Just to take two of the major theorists, Sir Henry Maine, in his famous book, Ancient Law, in 1861, Maine being a comparative lawyer who was concerned with rights and duties, Henry Maine distinguished between early societies, which were based on status, which was his way of describing kinship-dominated societies, and modern forms of society in which he, for example, lived, which were based on contract, the relationship between individuals within a state. As he put it, the movement of all progressive societies is from societies based on status to those based on contract. And he further elaborated this in suggesting that there had been a series of stages through which all societies would pass, some of them having done so and some would do so in the future. Patrilineal was the starting, then to matrilineal, then to cognatic or modern. Now his distinction between status and contract has been of fundamental importance, but his actual stages were in fact submerged by an even more famous set of stages elaborated by Lewis Henry Morgan in his work on ancient society in 1870. In ancient society, he set forward the view that all societies went through various stages. They started as matrilineal societies, then through patrilineal societies to cognatic or kinless societies. The conjugal family was totally absent, he thought, in the simplest of societies. Nothing whatever was based upon the family in any of its forms, he wrote. A flavor of the kind of evolutionary thinking that he proposed can be seen in the following quotation. It is both a natural and a proper desire to learn how savages advancing by slow, almost imperceptible steps attain the higher condition of barbarians. How barbarians, by similar progressive advancement, finally attained to civilization, and why other tribes and nations have been left behind in the race of progress. Originally, there was no private property, he argued, no individual marriage. The individual was completely submerged within the matrilineal clan. Gradually, the wider groupings broke down, and the individual was torn himself free and became the modern individual. His influence, or the influence of this part of his work, was extremely important because it was upon this that Marx and Engels based their theories of the family, and in their work, or Engels' work, The Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State, this general scheme was adopted. It was only after, Engels argued, after the Middle Ages that the rising bourgeoisie managed to set man free from the domination of kinship. The creation of these free and equal persons was precisely one of the main functions of capitalist production. Allied with this were various theories of primitive promiscuity and marriage capture developed by people like McLennan. These theories dominated until the end of the 19th century, but they were already beginning to be challenged. There were two major challenges that took place. One of these was known as diffusionism. Evolutionism assumes that there's some inner logic or necessity that you must move through stages, you must move up a ladder. 
that move that things move basically also on a plane from lower to higher. It thus can easily be turned to the uses of political prophecy, as in the case of Marx, who predicted that one will have to move through stages of production and always end up at a certain type of socialist society. Or it could be used in the service of imperialism and colonialism. The backward peoples were at an earlier stage. With our help, they would move from that stage into the next stage and finally catch up and be at our present stage. But Morgan's views upon which this was based were soon bitterly attacked. And just to give you one example of the sort of criticisms, the American anthropologist Robert Lowy, in his book on primitive society in 1929, argued that as far as the matrilineal, patrilineal, cognatic scheme went, every one of the basic points in this line of argumentation may be dismissed as contrary to ethnological evidence. For example, the idea of primitive promiscuity was based on a misunderstanding of simple kinship terms of the kind we mentioned, mistranslation of father and mother. Just because people called a whole lot of people father or mother did not mean that they did not know who their real parents were. Secondly, there was growing evidence that clans and lineages ex uh, of, a, of an extended kinship type were absent in the simplest hunting-gathering societies, that it wasn't a matter of kinship dominating and then slowly becoming less and less dominant, as we've seen. In fact, these large kinship structures only appear with a far richer economic, industrial, ceremonial, and political equipment. Lowy claimed that he had found no mention of clans in accounts of the most primitive hunters, the Bushmen and the Pygmies. Thirdly, there was no necessity for societies to move through a clan stage. I can imagine, he says, the Andaman Islanders, a siblis, that is, without clans, a siblis people without any noticeable partiality for either side of the family, their cognatic, rising by successive borrowings to any stage of civilization without necessarily developing into either father, sibs, or mother sibs, i.e. patrilineal or matrilineal. As for the view that primitive societies are democratic and don't have any concepts of private ownership, and that they gradually developed these. They became less democratic, as Morgan had argued. He writes, it may be said categorically that even at his worst, Morgan never perpetrated more palpable nonsense than that is saying a good deal. In fact, Lowy approvingly quotes the words of the great English legal historian F.W. Maitland, who pointed out that there is no necessity of passing through stages in this way. As Maitland put it, our Anglo-Saxon ancestors did not arrive at the alphabet or at the Nicene Creed by traversing a long series of stages. They leapt to the one and they leapt to the other. Basically, diffusionism is based on this premise that ideas and institutions can spread and when they are adopted by peoples, you can miss out all sorts of supposed stages. The metaphor really is of a, something a pebble being dropped in the center of a, a pond and the ripples go outwards and uh, encompass and engulf other societies. Now, that diffusionist, and the word diffusion covers this kind of interpretation, that diffusionist interpretation led to a certain number of rather extreme arguments that everything had started in the Middle East or in a particular society at a specific time and moved outwards and the attempt to try and find cultural traits which had moved from A to B.